Welcome to an episode of Vidhi Footprints and Signs of Time. This is a tale of survivors and achievers. There is a famous Sanskrit shloka that goes Vidvatvam Chandrapatvam Cha Naivatulyam Kadachana Swadeshe Poojate Rajan Vidvan Sarvatra Poojate. It says that the glory and the exhalation of a scholar goes beyond the, the provinces of his land. And I'm greeting to have all of you here and it's an absolute honor to have you sir. We thank you for the opportunity that you have given. So throughout your life, you have seen many twists and turns, many trials and tribulations and it will be a matter of pride for us to sit with you today and to learn about all of them. And I'm sure out of the poetry of your life, a prose or two can inspire many. So sir, are you ready to revisit your own life in your own show? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Saru. Thank you, Gauri, for inviting me. Such an honor. Thank you. We want to start by just going back to 1966 and then following up after that. So, we, you were born in the Garden City of Bengaluru, uh, much quieter then, I'm sure. Um, how was your childhood, sir? The best memories of it? Oh, fantastic. I mean, uh, uh, I was born on a Shivaratri, so it's... Uh, in Feb 19, 1966, and uh, um, had an awesome time. I mean, my parents, my dad, uh, Ramurthy Rao, is an engineer. He was at that point of time working in Bharat Electronics. And my mother, she uh, is one of my role models, a uh, sports person. I mean, the women in the family have always been in sports, right? Uh, my grandmother was a tennis champion, my mother was a ball band national champion. And then, of course, my sister came into our life and she was a table tennis and my daughter was into, you know, um, gymnastics. So all of them have been in sports and I think um, it's a very sporting family, I would say. So um, uh, it's been a fantastic uh, life and, uh, you know, I think life is a celebration and I believe um, we should uh, live a full life. So my childhood was brilliant. I mean, um, everything was perfect. I was blessed to be born in this great country, India, and that too, my favorite city in the world, Bangalore. Thank you so much. It's such a beautiful thing to listen about your own city at home. Uh, I've heard so many times you talking about the debates that you had when you were in national high school, uh, the competitions that you used to go to, the, the, all the naughty things that you used to do in college. Can you just elaborate on one or two anecdotes of it so that we know the you know, uh, non surgeon side of Dr. Girish Rao as well. Well, um, as I told you, my parents were my inspiration. My father would push me in almost every competition, starting from my primary school. I still remember my first um, time I went on stage was probably in first time when um, I had to play in a drama and I forgot the lines. Completely. That's hard so, to believe, sir. I, I mean, I was just there and everybody said, come on, say something. And I made my own life, so. <laughs> and we managed, we camouflaged it even at that point of time. I still have it photographed at home. So, um, during my primary school, um, I used to participate in a lot of competitions. And my father pushed me into that, I would say. Uh, he would actually write the script for me. I mean, this was the kind of sacred. And it was brilliant, like, you know. and. Uh, I had to talk on the debates, it used to be the mono acting and the drama competitions and uh, we used to have cricket commentary competitions so we used to listen to the radio and then it was Gunda Pavishwanath or Chandrasekhar cricket, uh, we used to comment on that and on all these things I used to get first prize. So. And uh, from school we had the inter-school competition, our school Saraswati Vidyananda had about 13 branches and the inter-school competition the Madhavan Park branch where I was there. We had a very, very close net group, I would say. We used to go for all these competitions. And believe it or not, 50 years down the line, we are still together, that wow. group. So that's my oldest uh, group which I have. So childhood has been fantastic from schooling days and things like that. So uh, going on from my primary school to high school, uh, I studied in another very famous school in Bangalore. Uh, that's the National High School. It's almost a century old now. And in that school, um, we were encouraged to very actively participate in debates as well as in something called a science speaking contest. 
And at that time, that was a rich science fiction contest. And we used to have inter-high school competitions across Bangalore. And one of the things which we used to do is, we were an odd boy school. And uh, we would go and pick up the shield even before. <laughs> you know, that was the kind of like bullies, actually. And uh, we had a fantastic team. Um, Ramesh Arvin became a film actor. He was like a captain of our like, group. And I was there, and H. V. Satish was a plastic surgeon today. So we were all, come, and Ramanand, one more good friend of mine, was a scientist, although medical background. So we four used to go to almost every competition from 8th standard to 10th standard, and we won a lot of competitions. So those were really, really good at the I was Wonderful. Why dentistry after that? Oh, I did pretty well uh, even in my second PUC, and uh, I got an admission into an engineering school and I was waiting for the second list in a government school in uh, the medical list. Uh, I had 91.3 and I was first in the merit in a private school. So I, I started thinking, what should I do? And something different. My father is an engineer, my grandfather was an engineer and a lot of uncles of mine were all doctors. So I wanted to be something different and I was looking for you know, let's not be just another face in the crowd. And that's when, just out of the blue, I get a letter saying that you are first in the merit list of dentistry at Government Dental College, and you need to go in within 24 hours and pay the admission fee to join dentistry, otherwise your seat will go off. And suddenly it struck to me, hey, dentistry, why not? And it just came out of the blue. I never, ever thought that I would become a dentist. But uh, I think um, I, I somehow my gut feeling said this is what you should get into, and uh, I got into dentistry. And Although I got into medicine, I gave up my medical seat to come into dentistry. The dentistry was choice, not by oh, chance. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I've been passionate about dentistry ever since I went in, and, and I believe that there are so many things you could do out of dentistry. That's true. Those five years were a roller coaster, I'm sure, with all the biggies in uh, GDC was the is the oldest institution in the country, and of course the first in Karnataka. So having come from GDC, the whole list of alumni itself is uh, are all legendaries. So uh, I mean, even you are in those in the list of the legendaries who have come out of Government Dental College. So I'm sure those five years were a, a huge uh, impact in your life going on. Absolutely. I mean, um, when we were there, uh, um, I think who is who of dentistry, at least in Karnataka, was there. We had Dr. Raju Shetty, who was the principal, Dr. Jagdish, who was the head of Endurantex, Dr. Nagesh uh, in oral medicine. And in every field, actually, we had uh, the legends, I would say, of dentistry leading the departments. And that gave us a good molding, I would say. I mean, the value system which we were taught in the Government Dental College Bangalore was just over the world. And even today, when we are a part of the alumni, which we meet regularly, the bonding just, you know, just brings everybody from GDC together. And it's interesting that uh, the 60th year celebration of GDC, uh, we did it. In fact, we had a cruise in America, and we were almost about 400 of us. That was the kind of binding which we had from the first batch which was, I, I still remember Dr. Mrutanjaya who was uh, practicing in uh, Rochester and my daughter took up dentistry after me in the same school and she was the 60th batch. So when we had the fashion show in the cruise from uh, Los Angeles to Ensenada which we went in, they actually led the, you know, the fashion show. <laughs> First and the 60th. First and the 60th wow. batch. So that was something, you know, it, it was the commandership which we had, I think that was something fantastic. I'm, I'm blessed to be a part of Government Dental College, I would say. It's wonderful, wonderful <laughs> stories to hear, sir. So taking it a little ahead, mm -hmm. how did your journey go about after you finished your undergraduate? A lot of students, are, I assume, who are listening to this would be at a stage where they have finished their undergraduate mm -hmm. and they are at sea, they don't know what to do next. What was your decision making? What were the thoughts running in your head? Mm -hmm. um, I always, as I said, I wanted to be something different. So all the four years, I got actually a scholarship from Colgate Pomodoro, being the first rank in the university. And I would invest in shares, believe it or not, those days <laughs> itself. Wow. 
<laughs> Entrepreneur in UK market. I, I used my scholarship money to buy shares, and that grew over a period of time. So I'm always keen on multiplying and sort of growing. So then, um, at the end of dentistry, I was very, very keen that I should do surgery. And um, um, although I got second rank in uh, uh, the state, I got oral medicine and I took it up because I thought medicine is the key to foundation. So I took the passion. And those days, MBS used to be only two years. So almost a year I completed in oral medicine. Uh, that was a fantastic experience. So I then cracked the national exam and got fifth rank and moved into Chennai uh, at the Government Dental College uh, of Chennai. Uh, and everybody wanted to become an orthodontist. Believe it or not, the first 10 ranks was always orthodontics. And I broke the kind of uh, the routine there, I would say, um, by choosing surgery. Right? Yeah. Surgery at that point of time was only extractions and probably wiring. That's all, most of them. And if you had a jaw tumor, we would resect it and no reconstruction. And the simple pathologies is all which was being done at that point of time. I knew surgery is going to take off in a very, very big way. It's the gut feel, you know, the sixth sense says you don't limit yourself, grow beyond what it is. And that's how I chose maxillofacial surgery. And that's my passion. I mean, I love every bit of it. For 32 years, I've been practicing maxillofacial surgery. I breathe maxillofacial surgery, I sleep with maxillofacial surgery, and I love it. So that's my passion. Uh, we cannot go um, ahead without talking about your madam. Um, <laughs> Dr. Manuja, uh, we've heard so much. I mean, you are our inspiration and she was yours. So indirectly, even though we have not met her, um, I'm sure, you know, we've always been inspired by how she was as a female maxillofacial surgeon. Just a few thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, Manuja Mandan was more of a mother figure to me. And when I went to Chennai, I don't know, it's just that, you know, she just picked me up like that. and said, I'm going to mold you, train. right, and train you, that's the kind of thing. Now, those days, surgery was a very, very male-dominated kind of thing, and especially in Tamil Nadu, if you really look at it, and she was like the iron lady, and that's what which struck to me. I said, if you really stick out and push yourself, people will give way, is what I thought, and that's what I would admire with her. And she had the guts to take up any surgery, I mean, be it a complicated TMJ ankylosis or a huge envelope. We used to get those endoblastomas which used to be huge and we would resect them. We would never reconstruct them though. So, um, I, I mean, madam would make us work, 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 work. We would start our work at 6.30 in the morning. Our OPD would start off at 6.30 and we would finish by about 1 o'clock. Everything is done. And our OPD used to, you know, in Dominant Dental College Chennai, I don't think anywhere you get that numbers. The surgery department, maxillofacial surgery department used to get on an average of 1,000 patients a day. Okay. And I still remember once, the interns had all gone on a you know, picnic, mm -hmm. right, for a junior batch, and we were four post-graduates. The senior batch was actually preparing for the exams and they had taken on. So it was just four of us, and we had to and some of our staff members also joined this, so it was a challenge which we had to take. Who would pull out maximum number of teeth? <laughs> right? In, in that day. In that day. And I still remember I counted something like 240 teeth. Wow. On a day. So the, the kind of experience for minor oral surgeries, what we had, was just unbelievable. And even now, I can close my eyes, put a forceps in, and feel the tooth, you know? It's like, it just comes out into your head. That's Listens the kind to of you, I think. That's how it, it it's works. the bond between the tooth and the hand, <laughs> which nobody else seems to understand. <laughs> oh, it was amazing, actually. I mean, the experience, what you get. I, mean, I think, at the end of the day, you know, people say, yes, it's the kind of technique, but numbers also will, you know, even, even if you haven't got the technique, the numbers itself will train you to become a good surgeon, and that's the kind of training you have. A lot of students who have finished their post-graduation feel that they are now ready to conquer the world and uh, underestimate the value of training post their post-graduation. We would like to know from your life how did that 
how did that happen your training after your post graduation and what what are the things that you did and how did you take your career ahead yeah you know the moment you finish your post graduation you think you are a consultant max professional surgeon and the first thing which i did was also get a visiting card <laughs> right <laughs> and that had a consultant over and max professional surgeon but little did i realize that i wasn't trained fully to take up max professional I was very well trained to do oral surgery. There's a lot of difference between the two, I would say. Minor surgical work, absolutely no problems, more like case. But when it came down to more complicated things, I still remember when I took up uh, a fellowship program in uh, Kidwai, right? Kidwai is a cancer hospital in Bangalore, one of the premium cancer institutes, I would say. And my boss, Dr. Kumar Swami, at that point of time, what he said is, um, you know, normal bleeding, and he said, um, put a knot on, I mean, like at the vessel. And I did not know how to use a hand knot as a surgeon, right? We would take the needle holder and stitch around the vessels, and that is how we were trained in Chennai, right? So it, it was uh, something which I had never seen major surgeries, neck being opened, and managing you know the internal jugula vein and big vessels of the neck and things like that so um, when he looked at the way in which i was handling a um, simple you know tiny vessel he said you need to go and train so at that point of time one of uh, our surgical you know mch training he was there i mean he probably molded me as a surgeon dr vijay kumar he became then the director of Kidwai and then now he's the vice chancellor of Yanapoya, I think uh, Yanapoya University. He took me under him and I would go and work with him for every surgical case, whether it's abdominal surgery or whether it's cervix or breast or prostrate, anything and everything he would actually take. For three months I worked with him and that general surgical training completely transformed the way in which we started thinking. So I think Every maxillofacial surgeon should be trained in general surgery very, very well. And that's something which is very, very important. Um, another thing which happened is just as I was finishing my post graduation, we had never been to a conference, right? A maxillofacial congress. So in Darwad, um, at that time, AMSI was conducting a conference. And because it was in South India, I went and pleaded my medal. Madam Manager. And generally, postgraduates were never allowed to go to any conferences at that point of time. Right? And because I was a favorite, I went and pleaded and pleaded. So, all four of us were postgraduates um, Vinod and myself and uh, my Dr. Victor, and we all, you know, a couple of times we requested, said, okay, go. So when we went, came to Darwad, first time I was introduced to things like orthognathic surgery, you know, and uh, reconstruction of TMJ, osteoconography. We just reset a gap arthroplasty wall which we were doing. And, um, you know, when uh, we saw the kind of things, and John Williams had come in. I mean, this was the book we used to read. Like, he was a god for us, you know. Williams, you know, maxwell Facial textbook of trauma was like, he was somewhere there. I mean, we would pray like, like Vishnu Bhavas, right? <laughs> and I was saying this, and I'm talking to him. So I got inspired. And at that point of time, the key person from Indian side was Paul Sons. He is my old one, right? And he was doing an orthognathic surgery, and he was giving all these lectures. And we have never seen an orthognathic surgery. We had read the author of orthognathic. It was only a textbook surgery for us. So, uh, in the evening when we were all having a beer, all our friends, some of our postgraduates, and I remember Suresh Shetty and Vinod and Dr. Gopal and a couple of others, Dr. Krishnamurti, we all said, if these guys can do it, I just mooted this idea, why can't we do orthognathic surgery, right? Everybody laughed, I think all of us should go to UK, is what we said, let's go and train. This is the mecca for us, this is the first time we've seen something like that. And that's how a bunch of us, we all went to UK and we trained over there. And some of them stayed back. I still uh, have good friends like uh, Yatunandan and uh, you know, Suresh Shetty who are still there. And some of us came back. And we started training the next generation. And that's how 
a lot of things have changed in India today. So I think the scope is there for the youngsters to really believe that there is so much of potential in this uh, beautiful speciality of mind's location, certainly. So it's just the passion. You need to drive, you need to be in the driving seat and sky's the limit of what you can achieve. I think that decade of UK dream and that actually happening is for another podcast because the stories that we've heard through you as and when we've gone, I mean as and when we've been through is just amazing and uh, it's very difficult I'm sure to pick up just a few anecdotes of it. But few people you want to remember from uh, those days. Yeah, I mean I went to uh, UK at end of 91 mm -hmm. and um, came back in 99. So it's the whole of 90s. I would say it was something, uh, probably the best part of my life. I mean, in terms of work, had a fabulous dream. I mean, I was, I cannot ask for anything better than that. You know, one of the biggest advantages was I was already well trained, I would say, from India in terms of certain skills. And I was keen to polish a lot of these things and learn some new things. So it was already there. And UK at that point of time was really, really good. So I started off in Canisburn Hospital in Glasgow and I, I must say that Prof Moose, he was one of the greatest craniofacial surgeons at that point of time and he was such a source of inspiration. I mean he would work from morning till night. I mean the kind of energy which he had was just mind boggling. So that was an observer post but that was really really something which pushed me to think that we should be doing craniofacial surgery in India. And then I moved into another very, very quiet place. It's like the English Riviera. It's called as Torquay. And uh, that is in the southwest of England. Very quiet place. But my boss, Dr. Hugh Walters, Mr. Hugh Walters, he's also no more sadly. Um, again, a very, very traditional Englishman. He had long uh, sideburns and then long hair. And he would wear a monocle. And I thought, what am I going to do with this man? <laughs> <laughs> he would come on a horse sometimes to the <laughs> hospital, believe it or not, he was an avid horse rider. A full of life, he would go for hunting and I mean, I, I learned that there is so much to life with him. But he was the most tech savvy man I would ever seen. You wouldn't believe that this guy was a musician, he would compose music, he would write programs in computers, he would do oncology, he would do orthopedic surgery, he was a simply qualified guy. So he was my source of inspiration again, and it was amazing to work with him. Again, he loved me. So he allowed me to do a lot of things. But it was a very quiet place. Totally had its own thing. And then I moved to London as a registrar at one of the oldest hospitals, St. Bart's and uh, uh, Royal London. And I had some fantastic bosses. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I would say guru is something you, know, you need to. When the student is ready, you get the guru is what they say. And probably I was ready to learn more. My hunger was so much. And I was very lucky to work with one of the most aggressive maxillofacial surgeons I've ever come across. Is Ian Hutchison, my boss. I love him. I mean, you know, he would make me work from 6 in the morning till 12 in the night. There's nothing other than work, work, work. Right? He was an oncology surgeon. I mean, he would do a hell lot of old oncology. What was impossible, he would make it happen. Right? So that's something which gave me a lot of kind of hands-on training and the kind of um, confidence that you can do a lot of things. And even if there's a complication, you could do it. We did a lot of thyroids, we did a lot of parotids, and I would say edictins. It's not just ordinary resection. Sometimes you used to get huge tumors. I still remember one patient came from Africa, Hakim Shitta, his name was. He was a photographer. He looked like Brahma, three heads. One huge tumor like this, another is he had another tumor coming up from the occipital. It was like a head, right? And we resected that and reconstructed this guy with so much of funding coming from all over the world. So my boss was a celebrity surgeon kind of thing. So I learned a lot from him. And I also had two more other bosses, I would say, although there were five or six of them, but I definitely said Kieran Coglin, again, a very, very meticulous surgeon, right? Precision to the core, in, you know, the way in which you take a bite, how much it has to be from the edge of the mucosa, it has to be two or three millimeters. Watertight closures, you know, especially for aesthetic work, orthopedic surgery, if you have to move the maxilla by three millimeters, it had to be bang on three millimeters. Today, you have 3D technology and you can print it. 
Ours was all freehand. We would actually cut the models, plaster Paris models, and move them. So it was something amazing, the kind of precision. And the third boss in London again was John Carter. And he would give me a free hand. He was a combination of Ian Hutchison and Kiran Carter. He had the precision, but also the guns of it. So it was like a, you know, the finishing school was with John Carter. And three bosses really did. And these were the Trimurtis, which polished me, I would say, before I came to India. And they were a fantastic journey. I mean, they really came. So I loved it. Moving on, you spoke about having a complete life. Mm -hmm. So we cannot complete talking to you without the role of your family, sir. Oh, yeah. So we want to get into how you got married and what was the story there and how uh, ma'am has actually uh, elevated you as a person and also as a surgeon. Yeah, I mean, uh, Sujata is my wife and uh, we got married in 94. Uh, one of the trips where I came from, uh, you know, from UK, um, my mom had selected three girls actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of them is what she had said. It was like all the shortlisting and all. The moment I saw Sujata, I just fell for her. She was a young, innocent girl. And she was only 20 at that point of time. And I just fell head over heels in love with her. Got married to her and in about three weeks I'd taken her off to UK. I mean, she had no clue at all that she was going to UK and we had a fabulous time. I mean I would say, the, as I told you, Chorki was such a beautiful place. It was by the sea and pretty quiet place. So we had almost a year of honeymoon, I would say. <laughs> Fantastic time I had. And then we traveled extensively across uh, UK and then the whole of Europe, actually. I love traveling. And I would just say to the car, OK, which direction? You know, we never had GPS or anything like that at that point of time, right? We never had. We had to take the maps, you had the A to Z maps and the road maps, big maps, and she was the navigator. So, okay, today we go to Devon, right? From Devon we would go to, you know, it could be the next one, it's one. Or sometimes to East Anglia. Or sometimes she would say, shall we go to London to have masala? She would travel all the way to about 250 miles to eat at those side and come back. And we really, really had a great life that way. And she has been the backbone to me. You know, she loved, she didn't hate, you know, all my photographs. I loved all taking photographs and documenting. I would say, this is surgical pornography, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How can you look so bare, like, you know, she would say, you know, all the blood and bone and things like that. But initially she would hate it, but then she started organizing everything and making all my presentations and things like that. And we have, you know, come through this journey together and she has been, Completely everything what I have today she is with me in fact. Wonderful. Traveling the world, you've traveled over 60 countries in the world till now. So what have you learned from different cultures through traveling the world? I mean, of course, surgery is uh, your passion, it's such a major part of your life. But I think um, the culture that we put in work as well as in life uh, depends on all the experiences that you've had, not just in one place, but across the world. So, uh, can you tell us some cultural experiences, something that you learned? I mean, coming, come, coming from India, you know, you, we are already exposed to a lot of different cultures in India. I mean, India has its own different cultures, different foods. You know, every state has its own kind of charm. But uh, that had already prepared me that there is so much of differences in different parts of the world. And when I started traveling, I, I mean, I like to go not into the traditional kind of touristic place. Yes, you have to visit, uh, you know, when you go to Paris, and you have to see Eiffel Tower and, you know, all the important places and uh, things like that. But the beauty is actually when you go into the small places over there and see how people live, whether it's in Japan or whether it is in America or whether it's in Africa or the Middle East, I always go to a small, you know, corner shop kind of thing or a small supermarket kind of thing. And you see local people and take walks around there, early morning and evening walks and things like that. And you see that every human being is the same. At the end of the day, we are all the same. We may be living in Japan, we may have a different culture, different religion, different language, different folk, but humanity is just the same. Whether it's in South America or whether it is in Africa or in Asian continents. 
absolutely the same. People are people and they are nice. They connect you and if you are talking to them and you give them a bit of respect, any country I'm telling you, they respect you even more. I have places where people look at me and then they think that I'm an alien and taking photographs of me. <laughs> it's happened to me in China. I went to a remote place. You know, even in Thailand when I went, I went to a place called Ayutthaya, which is the old capital, right? Ayodhya, which we have, so their old capital before uh, Bangkok was Ayutthaya. And we went into a very, very small village and people had never seen an Indian, I think. You know, brown color and different, uh, you know, black hair and things like that. So they all came into photographs. It was like a specimen or something like that. Or maybe a celebrity, God knows who it is. But what I'm saying is there is love. The human love is there everywhere. So I think we are all just the same. You know, it really doesn't matter. We all eat to enjoy and then sleep every day and then have a nice family and have a good laugh. And that's what the whole humanity is about. So I love traveling and I've done probably about 64, 65 now. I would like to hit a century. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> Another 20 years I want to travel. So 20 or 30 years if you are still around. You know, when you're born, sign. One thing which I would like to tell youngsters is start early. I'm telling you, every decade there is a huge difference. I know I'm in mid 50s now. I'm telling you the kind of energy what you have in your 20s to the 30s to the 40s, 50s, and I think probably in 60s it's even less. So. You need to push yourself, so start very early. I love to do a lot of trekking, and that's something which you should start doing early. Right. So from what we hear of it, your e- your UK stint was a was a roller coaster, and it was high, and you were at the pinnacle of success, and then you decided to come back to India. Mm-hmm. How did that happen? And to a lot of people, when you come when you came back to India, was were things served to you in a platter? It was tough, actually. I mean, it was a big decision which you always, you know, when when you have, you come to a crossroad and then you start looking which way you want to take the fork, it's very difficult. Um, I had a couple of choices. I could have stayed back in England, done my medicine there. You know, in UK you have to be doubly qualified. So you've got to go back into medical school and then get into again another surgical training and then become a consultant. So that was something like eight years ahead. And then the other option was I had a fellowship which had come up in Texas with Larry Wilford actually. He offered me when I went to the American thing. So I was looking at, I went and visited his unit and then I went and saw US also. But I felt America was not mine. I didn't want to settle there. I mean, it's a lovely country. I love to go to America. But I felt something was drawing me in. And I felt it is important to go to India back. In the meantime, I also had an offer from Saudi Arabia. I was thinking, but my bosses said, no, you're not going. So we trained you to go to India. And so I felt my wife also was instrumental. And she said, I'm more comfortable going back to India. Let's ra- you know, raise our children in India. So that's how we took a decision, a conscious decision to come back to India. It was a struggle. I mean, I was earning something like, you know, today's rupee is about four lakh, uh, you know, something like four, five thousand pounds or something like that. At that point of time, as a senior registrar, and suddenly, I was coming to about 200 pounds a month, right? It's like 12,000 rupees is what I was earning when my first salary came up. But it was quite a challenge. And India, nobody, you know, gives you an open kind of platter or anything like that. Um, I had a job. I mean, my boss, uh, Dr. K. Nagesh, one of my teachers, mentors, he offered me straight away when he had visited us in the UK. He said, whenever you want to come to India, come and join my school. That was Army Dental School where I had a stint for almost about 16 years, I was professor and head there. So I had a job, but that was only 200 pounds is what 12,000 what was started. But money was not everything in life, right? So you always wanted to come there, and then slowly you set up your practice, and that's how we started the whole journey. It was tough in the initial stages, but I loved every bit of coming. I mean, when you have everything going very well, there's no fun in there. You need to have some roadblocks, you need to again change gears, shift gears, and say, hey, I'm going to conquer this too. And that's what I did in India. I love my surgeries. I mean, I must have done 20,000 plus surgeries over the years in my you know, span of 22 years in India, back in India. 1999, I came back in May. So from then on, it's been a fantastic year. I mean, I've loved every bit of it. So 
uh, every country is good. I I always believe the time we had in the UK was the best. When I come, when I think now in India, I think I'm having a great life too. So you live that moment is what I believe. In. Nice. So you had all these mentors um, across all parts of your life, and then you became a mentor to so many students. So from all the mentors to you giving the mentorship about teaching and education, uh, what do you have to say? Um, I think I was blessed to have some great teachers, starting from Dr. Nagesh to Dr. Kumar Swami and my UK bosses, Manaja Madam and so many of them who inspired me. And uh, I think, you know, when you take and put this hat on as a teacher, it's uh, a moral obligation that knowledge has to be passed on. And um, I think it's such a great thing when uh, you know you teach your students what skills you know. And when you see your students or trainees doing better than you, that's the biggest job. I feel the greatest joy for any teacher is when he sees his students better than them. Right? I want you guys to be better than me. That's how you know the generations should be. And if you look at evolution, that is how we have all progressed. And I think that's a natural progression. And I hope more and more youngsters, when you become teachers, you train the next generation so that they are better than you. So our speciality grows and everybody benefits out of that. That's the basic philosophy. So one of the impressions that we first see you is the brilliance in your face. And I'm sure there is the happiness of being successful at work coming through it, having a good family coming through it, but also we see a spark of spirituality within you. So what is the wisdom that you have learned through your spiritual journey? It need not be a religious take journey, a spiritual journey from within that has come about. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I probably was an atheist during my childhood days and being a rebel I always questioned what religion is and uh, I was like one of those scientists who always felt that there is nothing like God or anything like that. I never believed that there is God and I was against that kind of kind of institutionalizing God. But then when you start maturing and when you start looking at science and especially when you come into medical and surgical field, that's when wisdom comes in, I think. As you age, when you see, I mean, this is all thanks to Laurie, <laughs> I'm still looking young. But I think with age, you get that kind of practical kind of experience. And you start thinking, there's so many limitations which you take them. And that's where there's something, maybe an energy, maybe a bigger force than what you are. And that is what we call as God, right? So I think there is so much of, uh, you know, at the end of the day, both science and spirituality, they meet and that's, you can't differentiate between the two. And this is something which you should experience. And that's where you start believing in certain magic which can happen when, especially when there's a bad case for us, and you're helpless. You've done your level best. And that's where you say, let me pray and hope that this patient recovers. So the goodness in you probably is transformed to the patient and the patient revives or whatever it is. Or God has shown his mercy on the patient and the patient has just revived and come out of whatever they have been through. So even a hopeless case sometimes becomes fantastic. What are the art of decision making, sir? Because sometimes you said that there is some you know, higher force which is actually telling you to do something, but your science, your education has told you to do something, and sometimes both of it combines for you to have that say, yes, this is what I want to do, and this is best. So what is the art of decision making? I think um, as a clinician, you need to have a logical kind of thinking. You know, there is a pattern for everything. So you need to first of all go through all that, right? And then I always believe that there are multiple solutions for a problem. You can't just have one solution. So it starts with planning. For me, for every situation, whether it's for any surgery also, I have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan B. Four solutions I would have thought of. And then I ponder, 
whether it's a simple surgery or whether it's a very complicated surgery, if there is a very complicated surgery, I put it into my mind and go to sleep with that. This is how I've done. Any complications which are there, I always think, 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 think and sleep with that problem. And generally when you wake up in the morning, there's some solution which you do. Because your brain is working throughout. Whether you call that as an instinct or a gut feeling or whatever, sixth sense, I don't know. But I think you wake up and many a times the sixth sense says, hey, I think if you do this, you're probably going to be right. And you follow that. And that instinct is very, very important. And that comes with experience also. It's not just that you believe that you know it is possible and things like that. You need to collectively start putting all your experience together and I think it worked many times. But logical sequence is the key. That's probably 90%. And then that other 10% is where you probably use your experience and take your sixth sense. In. So I, ha I remember having this conversation with you once that a surgeon is a combination of his training as well as his natural talents, instincts as you said, which develops over a period of time. So to a, to a young surgeon who is just taking baby steps, what would you advise him in order to become a good surgeon, when he should rely on his logic, when he should rely on his instinct and when he should carefully make it a combination of both of it? I think for any young surgeon, the key is training. They need to find a good mentor. And you know, you cannot learn surgery by just reading. You cannot learn surgery by just watching, you know, a video and saying, hey, I'm going to perform that. It's like, when you want to swim, you need to jump into the water. It's exactly the same thing. You need to do that. But to jump into the water, you must know how to swim and not drown. Right? <laughs> it's like that. So you need to find a good mentor who can actually hold your hand, who is genuinely good, who will train you. So that's very, very important. And be patient. You need to have that passion. I believe for anybody to become a good surgeon, after your MDS, I'm talking your post-graduation, you need to be trained and kind of nurtured for at least another five to eight years. That's the time when you're slowly given that independent kind of thing and you start taking good, bold decisions and then you're ready to go. And that's what I have believed, that whoever has worked with me, I want them to independently set up their own units because that is how specialities will grow, right? You cannot have somebody just always under your shadow. More new people should come and then these kids should start their own kind of setup. So I think passion, you know, your sincerity and uh, hard work is the key for your success. All other things, you know, 99% which is perspiration and 1% one, one is inspiration. That what, I totally agree on that. I mean, you know, this is something which you need to work hard for. So in the 60s, 70s and 80s, the technology was still not as much as what we have right now, the exposure. I, I still remember you saying that if I had to make a trunk call to India, I had to book it wait for so long then all I had to do is talk for a few minutes to my parents and that's about it and hospital use calls used to come through pagers and, and things like that so technology then and technology now has had a huge leap today every day the technology is uh, changing and for you to have seen that and for you to have seen this uh, what is it that is making the world run today um. Yeah, as you said, I'm lucky. I had, uh, you know, no technology or very, very scanty technology at that point of time. Sometimes scanty is also nice. You know? <laughs> different ways, I would say. But um, um, I think if you have technology, you need to embrace it. And it makes your life so much easier. It's more predictable. I mean, the way in which today we are using 3D printed technology, we are using AI, we are using machine learning, has made life so much easier. I mean, it, you know, what would take us so much of planning today, we can do a lot of virtual planning and, you know, with augmented reality and virtual reality. These things are very, very good. But there is something which I would like to tell the youngsters. There is a human factor also. You know, I've been to some of the tumor board meetings where you don't even have a patient and everything is discussed over there. You get the CT over there, you get the pathology over there, you have 
you know, every investigation in the Chima boards which we follow in uh, routine discussions. But examining the patient, taking a good history, listening to the patient is probably the key. If you want to be successful, you need to bring in tradition with the latest technology together. And if you marry these two things together, then you are a super winner. Trust me. You need to see your patient. You need to listen to them. Listen a lot. Because what the patient wants is more important than what you get. Yeah. Right? So understanding your patient, just giving that element of confidence to your patient, holding their hands and just saying that I'm going to take care of you is so important. There is a huge psychological factor. And that patient-doctor relationship, you get only when you are humane. You need to have empathy. Not sympathy. You need to have empathy. You need to feel for the patient. Genuinely feel for it. Then I think this guy is the limit to what you can achieve. Right. Speaking of these things and how passionate you are about it, you have worn many hats uh, as a doctor, a surgeon, a teacher, an administrator, an entrepreneur. Uh, what is that that you have within yourself? What keeps you going, taking up different roles? And how do you manage to enjoy all of it, sir? There are some times when you must be feeling, oh God, I can't do this anymore and throw that hat away. But I never seem to see you doing that at all. So how do you manage to keep yourself going? Love your life. That's all I can say. Love what you do. And do so many things. There's so much. I wish I was at least 30 years younger. <laughs> you know, I like to go on so a bike. I like to golf. I like to travel. I like to, you know, when I go to my farm, I love my agricultural kind of... I'm doing a lot of organic farming now. I take my tractor, I, you know, I do a lot of new things. In fact, I drove a JCB and that's probably, when I, when I see some of these kind of things, you know, just to lift, to blow the land up like this and lift it up and putting it into a tractor is something with a JCB. I felt, my God, there's so much of talent, there's so much to learn. <laughs> and you know, that hand, eye and mind coordination is something which is really, really good. So do a lot of things, keep yourself busy. And life is a celebration. I think the day you stop enjoying these kind of things, that's the end of your day. You should be passionate. Live a life fully. God has given you this kind of, you know, He sent you for a purpose. And I think you should love it. Live a full life. That's my kind of thing. And I'm enjoying every bit of it. <laughs> Honestly, so many things which I do, I, I really, really enjoy it. Love your family, love your students, love your... You know, your country, your whole world. And that's where when we say Vasudeva Kutumbam, is so much relevant. The whole world is one family. And that's true. It's just that, you know, silly people say that, oh, I'm colored, I'm this religion, that uh, region. Now, I think it's all silly differences. We need to just do away with that and say that we are one big human family. Love it. And we go to that one. The, you know, nature has given us so much of blessings. Enjoy that. Why do you want to spoil it? Right? <laughs> Contribute something to that instead. So the day you start shifting from always basically taking things to becoming a giver or a contributor, things become really, really different. So I believe that there is a huge opportunity for every human being to contribute something back to the mother society, whatever you want it. So there are five decades that you have seen through the past. What do you predict for the next five decades? I don't know. I like surprises. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want that surprise. I want. I still believe that there is going to be so much fun in life. Yeah, that's and, you know, for sure. I, I, I really am looking forward. I don't think I'm ever going to retire or probably do something more interesting <laughs> than what I've been doing so far. Uh, I, I think there is going to be so much more. I mean, you know. We, we are going to do a lot of things. I mean, we never had communication becoming so much easier. As you said earlier, making a telephone call was like, you know, so expensive and so difficult from UK to call my family. And today on WhatsApp, you have free communication, a video call which you can do any part of the world. And to, I still remember when I was doing my thesis, I did uh, on TMJ prosthesis, on TMJ replacement for ankylosis. That was 32 years back, 34 years back, right? 
At that point of time, to look for any articles, I had to go to Manipal from Chennai to look into the journals and then we used to have cards, we used to write in them, all the references and things like that and then come back. So there's so much of effort. Today, at the drop of the hat, on your phone, sitting anywhere in the world, you can basically see what anybody else is doing. So there is so much of sharing of information which is there. So use it. And I'm sure you probably can, you know, go into any OT and see somebody doing it and then next day come back into your own OT and replicate the same thing. So probably, you know, transporting yourself or what is that called as transforming yourself or something like that. What we used to see in Star Trek probably is going to happen. <laughs> Why not? We can even go to Mars and do Absolutely. surgery someday. Absolutely. We never Absolutely. know. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of surgery, sir, a lot of surgeons speak about the success, the triumphs. I'm sure in your career, you'd have seen many of failures. So, two parts of this question. First is, how do you respond to a failure? And second thing, how do you react it in a period of time? How do you get over it? For any young surgeon yeah. listening today, that could be the most important lesson. Correct. Right. I mean, if you haven't got a failure, I think probably I haven't done much. The more you do, then there are possibilities of you getting a lot of uh, problems too. I won't call that as a failure, but problems. I'll give you one simple example. You know, I had a young kid who came with a small hemangioma of the tongue. And uh, I sent him for a simple, you know, usual workup, where you do an angiogram and then a pre-operative embolization. There was a complication which happened. And unfortunately, the kid had a stroke and died even before I went in and operated on the patient. And that was very, very traumatic. I mean, when somebody comes trusting you and something like this happens, it will completely devastate. I mean, why did this such a thing happen to such an innocent kid who was full of life, right? And I hadn't even operated on this kid. And it, it, completely puts you in that kind of, uh, you know, low mood for quite some time. And as a surgeon, I think it's absolutely important that you're strong. Our training gives you that kind of thing that you need to disconnect, although there is a huge emotional kind of problem with that. But it's important that you are strong. There are limitations to what you can do. You can do a surgery to one extent, but the, uh, the complete, I would say, uh, the outcome depends on so many factors. The patient factor is very, very important, right? Whether the patient was cooperative, had he had any medical issues, many times complications happens because of medical problems. So that is something which you shouldn't take it to your heart. So it's important to detach yourself from the result. Absolutely. So when you get something really, really great, don't get overboard, nor when it goes down and you have a failure, don't get depressed either. So be balanced. And I think that is probably the key. Uh, so they say that the world is shrinking by technology. We've spoken so much about technology. But uh, we also feel that it is dividing by thought um, with all the social secularists. So many things happening in the society per se. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? Are we actually dividing by thought as a society? Where are we going? Um, nice question. Um, I think probably... Because of so much of information overload, people are becoming extremely isolated. You know, I mean, there's so much of, you know, things which you can do just on your phone. And uh, people are not socializing that much. And unfortunately, I think uh, it's nice to know what others are doing. But doing anything in excess or overdoing is not a good idea. So. I think that connect the human factor is very very important. I think socializing, mm -hmm. family members, you know, not sitting together and having a meal together, you know, that social bonding, friends meeting up together. I mean, you know, maybe just for a coffee together and just having a chit chat probably is much more fun than saying hi and you know talking through WhatsApp or you know through social media. So I think. We need to be very, very, very cautious about that, the way in which, as a society, we are going. And I think that has implications in terms of kind of depressions and suicidal tendencies and things like that. You don't get belonging to a group or something like that if you don't physically interact with people. 
So it's important to you know have these technologies, but I think our old values of meeting and socializing and just having a get together is probably very very important. So speaking on being together, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts about the art of networking? How is it? How important is it to be successful? And also the art of team building. We often see that you always believe and want to convey the idea of togetherness. So, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, you can go to one extent being alone. I mean, you can be a winner, but if you collectively grow and as a team, I think the amount to which you can actually succeed is probably way, way, way beyond what you can individually collect, you know, achieve. So I think very early on, I think it's absolutely important, especially for young maxillofacial surgeons. It's important that you hone on your skills. You know, I mean, today in our surgical specialty, maxillofacial surgery, you have trauma, you have oncology, you have clefts, you have craniofacial, you have simple dental implants. You cannot be good at everything. I mean, we were lucky that we had the entire exposure or the gambit of maxillofacial surgery. And I still do everything. I mean, but when I see the next generation, I think it's much, much better that you subspecialize. And when you subspecialize, it's absolutely important that you form teams, right? So one person could actually take trauma, the other could be doing uh, oncology, somebody else could be doing, you know, craniofacial work. And when you get this team together, you get collective kind of, uh, you know, the skills together and each person brings to the table their skills. So the patient benefits more and very soon you can actually become an expert in that chosen subspeciality is what I'm saying. So I think it's absolutely important that we work together and there's so much more benefit with uh, team building. Because why uh, the networking question we, we wanted to ask you is because uh, I think you probably know half the world, <laughs> uh, if we're not wrong. So, how to um, keep that bond going? In? So, you would maybe we wouldn't have met um, our colleagues or our doctors for a very long time, but still, maybe we require them to uh, you know refer a patient or tell somebody in our family that you can go to them. But even after so many years, we see when you give a call, that cordial relationship still exists. Absolutely. And that is something which uh, we always uh, aspire to have with family, with friends, with our medical colleagues, with mm-hmm. our dental colleagues, with our teachers, with our juniors. Because now, I think we've already lost in th- lost touch with our juniors in undergraduation and maybe even our batchmates in post-graduation. So how does that uh, happen, sir? Uh, I think the world has shrunk so much in a way, if you look at it from a different perspective, you know, patients come from different parts of the world. I mean, you know, when, when we were training, we had to go, you know, to different uh, countries to train. And now what's happened is the technology is so good in India, the expertise is so good, and we have the numbers actually. So you need to capitalize on that. And that's something which I would like to tell all our youngsters. It's absolutely important that you become bloody good in that, right? And you become a world authority. Publish it, talk about it. It's absolutely important. So what happens is patients will come from different parts of the world. Now if you have a network, now when they go back to their own country, you you have you know your own old friends and you know your batchmates and things like that. It's always nice to say, hey, this Hi. patient came from there, can you take care of that kind of thing? Right. So I think it's very, very important. Man is a social animal, right? So we need to socialize a lot. You need to keep your connections still open. And it's always nice to receive a patient from another part of the world and your friend sends them to you or you send to your friends, right? For taking care or whatever it is. So it could be an orthodontist. I have some orthodontists from US. They send their patients to me to do orthognathic surgery. And we plan on the, you know, on um, the net basically, we have a Zoom call, we decide with the patient sitting there, this is the kind of treatment, this is the kind of outcome, and the orthodontics is done over there, and he comes over, flies to India, gets the orthodontic surgery, we have had quite a few of these patients coming in. So that network is very, very vital for your growth. So definitely I would recommend, yeah. keep your friends very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of patients, they say that for a surgeon to become a wholesome product, 
he requires the support of his family his training his mentors this is the most crucial aspect of a surgeon to become a surgeon are his patients so what are your the top of your mind patients that you can think of who have helped you become a better surgeon mm-hmm. i think you learn a lot from your patients this is something which you need to know every patient who comes to you has something different and that's the uniqueness about our surgical specialty right you might be doing a simple wisdom tooth or it could be an orthopedic surgery or pushing the jaw back or it could be a cancer surgery everything is a challenge so every patient is actually teaching you so know that kind of thing and i think to carry on i think the feedback that you get from your patients is very very important so and some patient says i'm not very happy with the outcome then you need to really really have a course correction right why is this not the way i had planned right the best result is when you are happy and the patient is also happy the worst thing is you are very happy and the patient is unhappy right so it's absolutely important that you basically know how um, the response from the patient is so you know learn from your patients a lot of patients have uh, inspired me and i must say one patient who stands out which really melted my heart is this uh, man his name is kushna he came all the way from mauritius i'm talking almost about 15 years back and he had a maxillary tumor and they couldn't operate on him there so they came to india and we did a maxillectomy we gave him an obturator and that was helped with implants so he's very very happy right mm-hmm. and when he came back follow uh, his son um the daughter law was pregnant at that point of time and um, they came back after about 6 months and uh, they said doc we have a surprise for you so they showed me a photograph you know what we have named this guy girish girish krishna wow <laughs> you know, that's that is something which really melted me you know i mean the kind of love which you get from your patients is something which makes you feel that you should do much more than what you can do. So I always believe in the fact that give more than what they expect from you and I think you're going to really be really, really happy with that kind of work. Uh, how do you think people's stories uh, will impact other people going through the same situations? Because uh, we do tell a lot of uh, anecdotes to patients who are going through something which is of course not desirable to them, the reason why they come to us. Uh, but when we share their stories they'll be like oh okay maybe they went through and they conquered it and w- with this program i think we are intending to do the same thing so how do you think it will impact others i think um, um uh, you know a happy patient is extremely uh, capable of actually alleviating away the fears of so many other patients mm-hmm. right um they been through that i mean whatever you might say what we explain to the patients process and cons of the surgery is nothing compared to when a patient was been through that and this patient was about to go for surgery he sees somebody who has already you know crossed the show all right so uh, the connect which they get is much much better so many a times what i do is in the opd when they're there and the first time they come to us and they speak to us about the cancer and what's the problems and what they I'm anticipating with that. I explain to them in detail and then you know that usually in OP there are a couple of patients who are sitting there especially in oncology or even in orthognathic surgery when we do the joint clinics with my orthodontist those days what tends to happen is we have quite a few patients who are pre-op and some of them would have been post-op at different phases there. So it's always nice you just introduce the post-op patient to the pre-op patient. Of course you need to take their permission before you actually you know take that permission and then introduce and the magic happens so you don't have to worry and i've seen time and again patients come back to you say they come and say doc when shall i get my surgery done so that's the easiest way of actually you know getting this uh, fear out of the patients uh, so speaking about uh, carrying on we always talk about what legacy should we live should we leave behind and i'm sure i have not told you this story when i was in my second year of undergraduate in gdc it was a sunday morning and uh, there was nobody in the college and it was only one surgery pg who was there and there came a patient who had got a bad injury and he had a laceration 
extending across his face and since he had no one he just asked me to assist and that is when i was shown the world of maxillofacial surgery and the first thing that i went back and did was open youtube and type oral and maxillofacial surgeon the first video that i saw was a learn maxillofacial surgeon <laughs> video you operating on a gentleman from nairobi who had a bullet wound and i said yes this is what i want to become and i'm sure i'm just resonating uh, a tale of many such stories so you have inspired so many people and i'm sure many more are there who will be inspired with you from your work and from your words as well so what legacy do you wish to leave behind sir um i, I love my profession surgery and the biggest joy is when the youngsters like you guys actually take up the specialty with passion and i think if i can inspire probably about 1000 maxillofacial surgeons across the country we really have made a big difference or i have made a big difference so that's what i'm looking at and now that i've taken a leadership role as a secretary of uh, our association the association of maxillofacial surgeons of india i believe that there is such a huge potential you know collectively if we start doing a lot of things across the country my dream is you know india should be a leader in every aspect and especially in maxillofacial surgery i mean people should look up to our protocols right our ways of treating they should say hey in india they are doing it like i mean my dream is if somebody in america can actually follow our techniques they can cancel i mean oral cancer is you know india is the capital of oral cancer right they don't even see you know uh, 100th of what we actually see in india so we have always been following slow catering or md anderson and i think if our association that's what my dream is that we put up certain protocols in the management of cancer these are things which i'm looking at too and i must say that i was very glad when i was teaching at rb dental college um you know i didn't have that many post graduates and i still remember a batch where i had to I, and a group of interns were there and they used to come every day and uh, assist me in surgeries and then i think probably there were about 15 or something like that 10 of them took up maxillofacial surgery so that's the kind of thing which you can just ignite that spark i got ignited because paul also is you know did something wonderful and i think that is what every human being is capable of doing something and if you can just ignite that spark they will you know achieve a lot more so i think probably that is what i would like to leave you um i would also like to say that a lot of patients can inspire a lot of things and that's where from mukha facial surgery that's where i practice i would like to basically bring in a lot of interesting patients um just have a video podcast you know uh, which they would like to share to the public to the whole world and uh, you know talk about how their lives have got changed and that's where we are looking at a new kind of uh, podcast which we would like to introduce and that's where i would like to bring about vidhi vidhi is fit and um, the um, the thing which basically you know um, a whole series of interviews which i want you youngsters to talk to my patients and let the people know how they have you know been winners basically you know they have been through so much of difficulties in life and they have facial injuries or cancer or their facial deformities which we have corrected and if they can share their experience with you you know walk the time and uh, you know just share their stories with everybody that is something which i would love to do next so that's my new project which i would like to take up and thank you for giving me this uh, beautiful chance to talk to two wonderful people like you it's the honor is all ours sir we thank you for the opportunity that we have got and we hope to keep the fire burning we keep we hope to take the baton ahead and give people a reason to smile Absolutely. and and give them hope in their own lives the other part of the podcast what we have is that we are bringing in all the achievers who have inspired a lot of people doctors and other people in the society who have done great so along with the patients who are there to tell stories for other patients who are who are sailing in the same boat we also want people like us who can be inspired by so many people like you 
and uh, across the country and across the world and with the network that you have i'm sure will be able to they all of them can be our acquaintances at some point of time and we'll be able to bring in achievers as well as conquerors and make this podcast um, a household name absolutely i'd love to to see that <laughs> thank you for the opportunity sir pleasure, pleasure. thank you thanks a lot presenting um, vidhi the footprints on the sands of time thank you vidhi the podcast is dedicated to tales of healing and facilitators of health and well-being this is a mukha facial surgery initiative produced and brought to you by dr girish rao and mrs sujata girish podcast is hosted by dr shri gauri and dr sai swaroop thank you for listening